It was the best of times, it was the worst of times. Or it was just the worst of times. Jerusalem will have been destroyed, the temple burned, the people carried off into exile, and there in Babylon, surrounded by foreign gods, the Jews would be tempted to think that their God had failed, that their situation was beyond hope. Or perhaps that their sins had been so great that God had found reason to turn his back on them. You see, there are immediate threats, those things that are right in front of us, those things that we face day after day, and then there are ultimate threats. And the message of Isaiah throughout the 66 chapters of this book is that God wants us to trust him regardless of the situation, immediate or ultimate. The greatest reality in every situation is always God. God is and God can be trusted. Our text this morning brings together uh, and addresses ultimate needs. Isaiah chapter 42 declares God's design for salvation by bringing together, juxtaposing uh, two different servants. And understanding that our text brings together two servants is extremely important for understanding and dissecting what is in front of us. You see, there is servant Israel, there's God's servant Israel, and then there is the servant of the Lord, two different servants. Indeed, servant Israel had been called to be something so unique within the world, and yet they had, in many ways, failed to live up to God's expectations. Yet the servant of the Lord will be the ideal servant. The servant of the Lord will be the fulfillment of all that God had ever intended for Israel. There is servant Israel, and then there's the servant of the Lord. And it's only through the work of the servant of the Lord that servant Israel can become all that God intends for them. On this side of history, we read our text, Isaiah chapter 42, with the conviction that the servant of the Lord, this ideal servant, is none other than our Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, in Luke uh, and in Matthew and other places in the New Testament, the New Testament writers will actually quote at length this particular chapter because they are convinced that this man Jesus before them is this ideal servant of the Lord. And yet, regardless of the fact that this is Old Testament I believe that this text has a lot to speak to us today about God's design for salvation and in disclosing to us the nature of our Lord Jesus Christ. In our salvation, God does for us what we desperately need but cannot do for ourselves. In our salvation, God does for us what we desperately need but cannot do for ourselves. So I want to walk through our text this morning, and of course this is a long text, that's why we are reading the entirety of the text in its full, and I will will dip down into the text and read certain portions, Uh, and we're going to continue to do this throughout this Isaiah series. By the way, if you're interested in reading, uh, just let me know. We'll figure out how to record you reading, um, but let me know and we'll draw you into that schedule as well. So this morning as we walk through our text, let me point our attention to three characteristics, three traits of God's design for our salvation, based, again, on Isaiah chapter 42. Three characteristics of God's design for our salvation. Here's the first one. Salvation is through God's servant. Salvation is through God's servant. Chapter 42 opens with God calling attention to the first of these two servants in this chapter. Verse 1, behold my servant, behold my servant. And then in the first nine verses, God describes for Israel, again, hundreds of years before the birth of Jesus, God describes the character and the ministry of this servant through whom salvation will come. Notice some of the language that's used to describe this servant of the Lord. Notice his relationship to God, his relationship to God. Verse 1 reads, Behold my servant, whom I uphold, my chosen, in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him. Now, again, Isaiah is writing these words as a prophecy 700 years before the birth of Christ. And yet, in Jesus' baptism in Matthew chapter 3, he is intentionally drawing to the hearer's mind, 
echoes of this particular text. When Jesus was baptized 700 years later, he came up out of the water and the heavens were opened. Verse 16 of Matthew chapter 3, and he saw the Spirit of God, there it is, the Spirit of God descending on him like a dove and coming to rest on him. And behold, a voice from heaven said, what did he say? This is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. It's so going back to chapter 42 of Isaiah. This is my servant whom I uphold, my chosen, in whom I, my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him. That's the Lord Jesus. Notice his relationship to God. Notice also his relationship to the world. Notice the servant's relationship to the world in which he will find himself. That God's servant will be concerned about justice is very clear from our text. Because it's one of those words that is repeated over and over again. Verse 1, he will bring forth what? Justice to the nations. Verse 3, he will faithfully bring forth justice. Verse 4, he will not grow faint or be discouraged till he has established justice in all the earth. Yet notice the means, and we're going to continue to learn more about the servants of the Lord throughout uh, the book of Isaiah. This is just the first of four major sections in Isaiah in this particular chunk of Isaiah that we're addressing in this series. This is just the first of four, four major sections. Uh, but the means by which the servant will bring about justice will confound every natural assumption that we would have about power. The way that the servant of the Lord will do what this text requires, executing justice, bringing forth justice, establishing justice in the earth, the way that this servant will do that will confound our understanding of power. Look at verse 2. He will not cry aloud or lift up his voice. Or make it heard in the street. Verse 3. A bruised reed he will not break. And a faintly burning wick he will not quench. As enraged as we might become about our own experiences of injustice within the world, we might assume that God would just be like an amplification of us, but he's not. We might assume that God would respond in the same sort of enraged way with anger and retribution, bringing his strong hand to bear upon the injustices of this world, but he doesn't. Verse 3 uses two beautiful word pictures to describe the response of God through the servant of the Lord to the injustices of the world. A bruised reed he will not break. Just last week, we had the unfortunate opportunity to have some trees removed in our backyard. Big trees, big oak trees, 70, 80-year-old oak trees. When we finally got the oak trees down, we looked inside the trunk, and we could see that perhaps years ago, of course, prior to our ownership of the house, somebody else had let those trees get rotten on the inside. Yet regardless of the fact that they were rotten on the inside, those things could have stood for a long, long, long time. Because even a rotten tree has a lot of strength in it. But a reed, a broken or fragile reed, that's just a tall piece of grass. A reed is just like a tall piece of grass. A reed is worthless. It's something that we step on. And when a reed is bruised, it has absolutely no future. Who cares if a reed dies? And who cares if a broken or bruised reed is trampled underfoot? And yet the text says a bruised reed he will not break. A faintly burning wick he will not quench. A lantern with a faintly burning wick. If you've ever lit a lantern and the wick is just faintly burning, what do you see? You see smoke. You might see a small ember, but you mainly see smoke. More smoke than light. And to care for a faintly burning wick requires such gentleness and care. Because if you blow on a faintly burning wick with too much force, what happens? It snuffs out. And if you blow with too little, nothing happens. It requires such care. And yet we would respond to the situations and the, 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 the issues and the concerns within our world with busyness and with haste. We would, we would just 
disregard these things that are so fragile. Who cares about a faintly burning wick? Who cares about a bruised reed? Isaiah chapter 40. Who cares about those who would fall down and have very little strength? Who cares about the weary? And yet our text says, a bruised reed he will not break. A faintly burning wick he will not quench. The servant of the Lord cares. God's servant, our Lord Jesus, cares. I love this quotation by uh, the Puritan author uh, hundreds of years ago, 400 years ago, who says, God's salvation is strongly wrought and sweetly dispensed. God's salvation is strongly wrought and sweetly dispensed. That's Richard Sibbs. God's response to oppression through the servant of the Lord is not to bring more oppression. God's solution to the power struggles within our world is not to flex a bigger muscle. Through this servant, justice shall be established for the nations. He will not lift up his voice in the street, and yet he will be strong, and he will be gentle. So gentle, this servant in the establishment of justice will be so gentle that the exercise of his power will be mistaken for weakness. Save yourself, they're going to call to Jesus while he hangs on the cross. Save yourself. If you're the son of God, prove it. Come down from the cross. Yet the servant of God cares and will establish justice in a way that no human mind could comprehend. That is his response to the world. Why? Because he has a mission to save. Look at verse 6 in our text. Isaiah chapter 42, verse 6. I am the Lord. I have called you. He's speaking specifically to the servant of the Lord here in verse 6. I am the Lord. I have called you in righteousness. I will take you by the hand and I will keep you. I will give you as a covenant for the people, a light for the nations, to open the eyes of those that are blind, to bring out the oppressors from the dungeon, from the prison, those who sit in darkness. These words describe the mission of the servant of the Lord to save. In him, in this servant, he will be the locus point of salvation. In him, the nations of the earth, the nations of the earth will establish a relationship with God. Not a relationship external to the servant. Not a relationship held out by the servant of the Lord. Not a commodity that the servant of the Lord carries in his pocket. No, the servant of the Lord will be that relationship with God. The text says that he is the covenant. He is the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through him. And the scope of the servant of the Lord's salvation will extend far beyond the borders of Israel. It will extend to the nations as the, the gospel opens the eyes of those who are spiritually blind. And as the gospel breaks the chains of those who have been bound within sin. And the gospel will bring light to those who are in darkness. This is the mission, his mission to save. So that's the first servant. God's salvation is through his servant. And in light of all this, it's no wonder that the next part of our text, beginning in verse 10, just erupts with praise. It's such a beautiful, beautiful uh, section of Scripture. Yet praise is not a byproduct of salvation. We need to hear this. This is important, that, that, that praise is not a byproduct. It's not secondary to salvation. Praise is a part of God's design for salvation. It's a part of what God intends for salvation. So first, salvation is through God's servant. We're talking about the design, God's design for salvation. Number one, salvation is only through God's servant. Secondly, salvation is for God's praise. In chapter 41, the chapter that we addressed last week, the rise of Cyrus, this Persian king who would defeat the Babylonians, the rise of Cyrus would result with fear and and terror among the nations. And they would spin off and make idols because they're so afraid. Idol making, just another form of worship, by the way. 
But notice what happens with the rise of the servant of the Lord. When the servant of the Lord arises to bring forth God's salvation, not just to the Jews, but to the whole world, the world erupts with worship. Verse 10, sing to the Lord a new song, his praise from the ends of the earth. You who go down to the sea and all that fills it, the coastlands and their inhabitants, let the desert and its cities lift up their voice, the villages that Kedar inhabits. Let the habit inhabitants of Selah sing for joy. Let them shout from the top of the mountains. Let them give glory to the Lord and declare his praise in the coastlands. Notice that the song doesn't arise just from Israel. Rather, the song arises from the ends of the earth. This is for all people. This salvation through God's servant promised in Isaiah chapter 42 is not just for Israel. It's for the entire world. And it erupts in praise. The whole world erupts in worship. Why? Because, verse 13, the Lord goes out like a mighty man. Like a man of war, he stirs up his zeal. He cries out, he shouts aloud, and he shows himself mighty against his foes. God has shown up, and our experience of salvation ought to result in praise. Our experience of what God has done in reconciling us to himself, of forgiving us for our sins, of reconciling us to each other, ought to result in praise. God has not disregarded you. God has not left you to yourself. He has worked on behalf of sinners. And so we too burst forth, just like in this text, we burst forth in praise with a new song. With a new song, because a new work requires a new song. God's purpose in your salvation is not just for your security or for your benefits. Yes, it's that too. Yes, there is security. Yes, there is great benefit in being called a child of God. But even more than that, by design, God's salvation is intended to result in his worship. My life is by design in Christ to be a testimony of the praiseworthiness of God. In the words of Paul, God has called us in Christ that we might be to the praise of his glory. To the praise of his glory. As God saves me by his servant, as God saves you by his servant, we together with this throng of people globally, historically, imagine the dimensions of the body of Christ as God reconciles us, not just to him, but to each other. We come together in this global, historical chorus of praise toward the trustworthiness of God. We join a global chorus of praise to the worthiness of God to be trusted in all things, both ultimate and immediate. Verse 17, they are turned back and utterly put to shame who trust in carved idols, who say to metal images, you are our gods. You see, folks, there's going to come a day when all the things that we've trusted in as substitutes, all the things that we've trusted in that were alternatives, good things but not the best thing, those things that we've put in the place of God, that, that again, they're good things but they're not the best thing, there will come a day when all those things will be exposed for what they are. And there will come a day when what we trusted will either result in praise, glory, and honor to our Lord Jesus Christ, or shame for us for having trusted in a counterfeit. God wants to be first in your life. He wants to be number one. It's not just about what he does for you. It's about the, the fact that he is worthy of it all. God's design for salvation. Number one, salvation is through God's servant. Number two, salvation is for God's praise. But pause for a second. Who is even worthy of all that? Who is even worthy of the fact that the servant of the Lord, God's servant, Jesus Christ, would pay attention to us 
that he would enter into our time and our history and into our lives and, and, and reconcile us to himself. I mean, who's worthy of that? Well, that's the third point, the third characteristic of God's design for salvation. Salvation is to the undeserving. By design, salvation is to the undeserving. Remember, our text this morning holds out two servants, the servant of the Lord and servant Israel. Servant Israel had been chosen from among all the nations of the earth to be God's special possession, according to Exodus chapter 19, to be a kingdom of priests, a holy nation. God's intention, according to the promise that he had made to Abraham in Genesis chapter 12, was that through servant Israel, all the nations of the earth would be blessed. And yet there in exile, in the 6th century before Christ, it would seem as if God had completely disregarded them and was blind to their circumstances and had forgotten the promises that he'd made. It's so easy for us in the practice of religion to become presumptuous, to think that we deserve certain benefits, that God is unfair or unkind to turn a blind eye toward our concerns. However, God wasn't blind. They were accusing God of disregarding them, but, but God wasn't blind. God wasn't deaf to them. It wasn't God who was blind. It was Israel who had been blind. And so in verse 18, look at how the Lord addresses servant Israel. Again, remember, there are two servants in our text. Verse 18, hear you deaf and look you blind that you may see. Who is blind but my servant? This is a different servant. Who is deaf as my messenger whom I send? Who is blind as my dedicated one or blind as the servant of the Lord? He sees many things, but does not observe them. His ears are open, but he does not hear. And then in these following subsequent verses, God brings two charges against servant Israel. Number one, God had given his law, but they had not obeyed. Verse 21, the Lord was pleased for his righteousness sake to magnify his law and to make it glorious. This is a beautiful verse. God intended to magnify his law and to make it glorious through his relationship with Israel. God clearly made known to servant Israel what his expectations were, what it required to have a relationship with him. Yet God's intention was not just for Israel. God's intention was to magnify righteousness through his relationship with Israel so that through his relationship with Israel, all the world would know how awesome their God is. And what happened? Well, God brought the law. He brought the law, and he, 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 he intended to magnify his law through his relationship with servant Israel. Yet 24, verse 24, they sinned against the Lord in whose ways they would not walk and whose law they would not obey. So God gave his law, but they did not obey. that servant Israel. And so then the Lord brought consequences. Consequences for disobedience, consistent with Deuteronomy chapter 28, that there would be consequences for disobedience. And though he brought those consequences, they did not learn. God had foretold in advance that there would be consequences for disobedience. And there they were, they found themselves in exile in Babylon as God's punishment for their disobedience. Verse 25, so he poured out on them the heat of his anger and the, might of, and the might of battle. It set them all on fire all around. You see, the law not only declared God's expectations, but also the consequences for falling short. And there, faced with the fierceness of those consequences, Israel did not learn. Let me read the, the rest of verse 25. That's the last verse in our text for this morning. I'm going to go back and read it starting from the beginning. So he poured out on them the heat of his anger, the might of battle. It set them on fire all around. But he, speaking of servant Israel, did not understand. It burned him up, but he did not take it to heart. Before God, servant Israel stood completely undeserving of his attention. 
They were rebels and failures in their relationship with him, rebels against his law, failing to learn from the consequences of their own inability to uphold God's expectations of righteousness. Yet even still, here's the beautiful part about God's design for salvation. Yet even still, God holds out to them the invitation for salvation. Why? Because salvation is not for the deserving. Salvation by design is for the undeserving. God holds out to rebels and failures the invitation to be reconciled to him, not through their own work, but through the work of the servant of the Lord, our Lord Jesus Christ. God's design for salvation is is to extend grace to the undeserving, to give to those who have nothing of their own to merit God's favor. God's intention is to extend to them grace, people like you and me, to extend grace to us, those of us who know that we fall short. Verse 23 of Romans chapter 3, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The solution for servant Israel is the same solution for you and me. There has only always ever been one way to be reconciled to God. And that is through the Lord Jesus Christ. Servant of the Lord is the Lord Jesus Christ. Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. I love Isaiah chapter 42. Our Lord Jesus Christ, right in the middle of the Old Testament. In our salvation, God does for us what we desperately need, but cannot do for ourselves. That is the message of salvation. Salvation is through God's servant. Salvation is for God's praise. And salvation is to the undeserving. Salvation is only through the Lord Jesus Christ. Friends, if, you're, if, you've, if you've trusted in anything else for salvation, if you're trusting in anything else for ultimate things, turn your attention to the Lord Jesus. Salvation is for God's praise. Hey, let's, let's realize that, in, in fact, we, we are being recreated in Christ to be a, a mirror of God's glory, to refract God's glory so that other people will know how worthy he is. And salvation is to the undeserving. So let's give up trying to work for it. Let's just trust him for it. D.L. Moody once shared a story. I'm going to read this. It was a publication from Moody years ago. An old man got up in one of our meetings, Moody said, and he said, this old man said, I've been uh, for 42 years, 42 years I've been learning three things, the old man said. Moody writes, I pricked up my ears at that. I thought if I could find out in three minutes what a man had taken 43 years to, or 42 years to learn, I should like to do that. So the man said, I've learned three things. The first thing he said that he'd learned was that he could do nothing toward his own salvation. Well, I said to myself, this is the words of Moody, well, that's worth learning. The second thing he found out was that God did not require him to do anything. Well, that was worth finding out too. And then the third thing was that the Lord Jesus Christ had done it all. Salvation was finished. And that all he had to do was to take it. Friends, this morning, take it. Take it. If you have not taken it, take it. Moody concludes, Dear friends, let us learn this lesson. Let us give up struggling and striving and accept salvation at once. Friends, in our salvation... God has done for us that which we desperately need but cannot do for ourselves. Praise you for the grand design of salvation that you have extended to us in our Lord Jesus Christ. I pray, Lord, that you would continue to craft us and mold us and make us and remake us and form us and reform us so that we might be to the praise of your glorious grace. God, help us to relinquish control over this, these ultimate things, and help us to turn to you in absolute trust. We praise you for the gift of salvation in Jesus' name alone. And we pray these things in his name. Amen.